Meet Jonathan Bird. One of the world's top underwater nature cinematographers. Traveling the world on assignment for all the major networks, he is an Emmy Award winning authority on the underwater world. In freshwater or salt, reefs, wrecks or caves, Jonathan documents the world beneath the waves. Welcome to the Blue World. Sea turtles have been swimming in the world's oceans for 65 million years since the time of the dinosaurs. It may be surprising that these animals could be endangered after existing for so long on Earth, but it's true. There are only a few places left where sea turtles still thrive. And this is one of those places. I've come all the way to Sipadan Island in Malaysia to explore one of the world's most incredible sea turtle sanctuaries. Well, now we go. We head out towards the reefs of Sipadan Island. This island is so small that you can walk all the way around it on the beach in an hour. Yet, it has a huge population of sea turtles. I suit up for a dive to explore the reefs and hopefully find a few sea turtles. Immediately, I end up right in the middle of a huge school of jacks. Sipadan is known for massive schools of fish. As the school of jacks swims away, I spot my first sea turtle, a green sea turtle swimming over the reef. It wasn't hard because they're everywhere. Some are swimming around while others are napping on and in the reef. Sea turtles actually sleep underwater while holding their breath. A sea turtle can easily hold its breath over an hour. A few hundred feet away, I find a hawksbill sea turtle munching on the reef. She's plucking out tasty sponges and invertebrates that hide in the coral, rather than eat the coral itself. It takes a tough stomach to digest this stuff. That was incredible. I have never seen such big schools of fish anywhere, but the sea turtles. Man, I must have seen 30 sea turtles on one dive. Amazing. As we circle the island, I can see the tracks left in the sand by females that have climbed the beach to lay their eggs. It all starts when a male, identified by his long tail, catches up with a cooperative female and courts her. From the surface, I see the action and I prepare to film it. Here's the plan. I'm going to slip in, quietly grab the camera and off I go. And I need somebody to stand on the bow and just point at the turtles, okay? okay. Just uh, go up there. So I can see where the heck they are. As we approach closer, I gear up to head in. The mating has begun, and I quietly approach to film the action. Mating is not easy for the female sea turtle. She must swim and rise to breathe for both of them. The male's long tail holds the female and fertilizes the eggs, while claws on his front flippers give him the ability to grasp the female's shell. The commotion doesn't go unnoticed by other males in the area. 
they flock to the mating pair which have drifted away from the reef. In competition for a limited number of females, the other males look for ways to dislodge the suitor. One challenger bites his flipper. When that doesn't work, he tries a blast of air bubbles. He tries sticking his head between the mating pair, hoping to wedge them apart. Through it all, the mating male must hang on and tough it out. Fighting back would mean losing his grip, and that's just what his rivals want. Eventually, no less than four additional male turtles arrive to challenge the suitor. They all try the same techniques, and it's starting to wear him down. Meanwhile, the female is near exhaustion. The male is only struggling to hold on. The female is struggling to survive. Seeing this incredible struggle in person for the first time gives me a lot of respect for sea turtles. Hours later, the male has outlasted his rivals. He fertilizes the female's eggs, and with luck, his genes will continue on. As if her job weren't hard enough already, the female now faces another tremendous task to lay the eggs, but it must wait until nightfall. After the sun sets, I head to the beach in total darkness. I've come ashore at night to see if I can find some nesting turtles. The females come ashore and they lay their eggs in the sand, but I have to be really quiet because if they see me or they hear me, they'll take off right back into the ocean. Using infrared night vision equipment, I've found a turtle hauling herself out of the water, painstakingly clawing her way up the beach to high ground. Although sea turtles live their entire lives in the ocean, they lay their eggs in a nest on the beach. After the sea turtle reaches an area well above the high tide line, she begins to throw sand around to create a pit. I have to be very quiet because I'm sneaking up on a turtle that's nesting. They get pretty nervous when they're nesting because predators are everywhere. She must stop frequently to catch her breath. Her crushing weight on land literally asphyxiates her. She begins to dig a hole about three feet deep with her rear flippers. The hole doesn't just protect the eggs from predators. The sex of the baby turtles is a function of the incubation temperature. A shallow nest baking in the sun will be too warm and all the babies will be female. A deep one will be too cold and the babies will all be male. Digging to the right depth ensures a good mix of males and females. She can't see what she's doing. The hole must be dug entirely by feel. As she begins laying her eggs, we can gradually bring up some normal lighting. She's committed to the nest now. At last, she begins to lay as many as 100 squishy eggs about the size of ping pong balls into the nest. In two months, these eggs will hatch and the baby sea turtles will emerge.
After she's finished laying her eggs, she carefully fills in the hole. Then she cleverly disguises the exact location of the nest by flinging some more sand around. After two hours of effort, she plods her way laboriously back to the sea, completely exhausted. For a sea turtle, a hundred feet back to the water is like running a marathon. It requires enormous effort. Her body is just not designed for travel on land. She needs the weightlessness of the ocean to catch her breath and cool down. Finally, she heads back to the reef for a well-deserved rest. Two months later, newly hatched sea turtles race to the sea. Each baby turtle must rush past a gauntlet of predators from land, sky, and sea to reach the open ocean. Odds are, only one of these baby sea turtles will survive. On their journey, the sea turtles must fight their way through the surf, swim across the shallows, and then make their way to the open ocean, away from predators on the reef. They won't return to their home on the reef until they're large enough to be safe, about the size of a dinner plate. It's a long and perilous journey, but if this sea turtle survives, it may go on to live over a hundred years. People come here to yap in the middle of the Pacific Ocean to dive on beautiful coral reefs and meet the manta rays. I noticed that 90% of the island is covered in these beautiful lush mangrove forests, so I got special permission from the chief of Baychel Village to explore the mangroves. Mangroves are a type of plant living in the tidal coastal areas between sea and land. All share the trait of being able to tolerate partial submersion in salt water and poor oxygen content in the ground where their roots penetrate. Mangroves only grow in the tropics like these rich mangrove forests in Yap. Mangroves are extremely important for several reasons. First, they serve as a buffer zone between the ocean and the shore. Their roots hold the shoreline together, limiting erosion and attenuating the waves. In effect, they form a protective barrier between the ocean and the land. Second, and perhaps more importantly, mangroves serve as a refuge for marine life. The tangled maze of roots in the mangrove forest creates a confusing shallow water labyrinth. Taking refuge in this protective maze, many animals survive here when they couldn't survive anywhere else. The mangrove is a nursery for juvenile fish and invertebrates. In the protection of the calm, sheltered waters of the mangroves away from predators, the juvenile fish find food and safety. Without the mangrove nursery, life on the reefs would be in trouble. Mangroves live in salt water, which is a tough environment for a plant. The roots are designed to soak up the water and exclude as much salt as possible in the process. They have little filters built into their cells. But the plants still take in a fair amount of salt, and they have to get rid of it or it'll kill the tree. And they get rid of it by concentrating it in their leaves. Some mangrove trees excrete the salt out through the leaf as a crystal, which is then washed away by rain. You can taste the salt on the leaves. Hmm. Other trees concentrate the salt in older leaves, which then turn yellow and fall off, taking the salt with them. All those leaves land in the water, sink to the bottom, and decompose. 
The mud has a high concentration of bacteria to break down all the organic material. These bubbles on the bottom are mostly methane, the byproduct of decomposition. The bacteria consume the leaves, releasing nutrients that wash out to sea every day on the receding tide. So the mangroves are an important food and nutrient source for animals and plants on the reefs and in the open ocean. Most trees have their roots completely underground. Mangrove trees have their roots coming up out of the water into the air like this. That's because the soil down below the water here is a black muck that's high in bacteria, has very little oxygen in it, so the roots can't absorb any oxygen. So when they come up into the air, they absorb the oxygen directly through their skin. Partially submerged conditions in mangrove forests make it hard for traditional seeds to take root, so reproduction requires special seeds. This is a mangrove seed. The seed parts up here, but it has a long root already on it. When it falls off the tree, it floats like a cork with this part up and this part down. When it floats into shallow water, this part will go right into the soft bottom and the leaves will come out the top and you have an instant mangrove tree ready to start growing. This adaptation allows a seed to take root in shallow water with the root in the bottom and the leaves at the surface. Exploring the mangroves, I realize not only how fascinating this habitat is, but important as well. It's imperative that as coastal development continues, care is taken not to overlook the importance and beauty of the mangrove forests, the nurseries of the reefs. They're not just part of the land or part of the ocean, but a critically important link between these two worlds. Don't go away. Jonathan is off looking for wolf fish, and they're not what they appear to be. One of my favorite places to dive is Eastport, Maine. The water's cold, but the bottom is covered with an incredible amount of colorful marine life. Eastport is near the Canadian border at the mouth of the Bay of Fundy. The huge tidal range in Eastport means that the water's almost always flowing one way or the other as the tide comes in or goes out. The moving water full of plankton feeds a ton of invertebrates, making the bottom lush. It gives me plenty of things to film on every dive. There's pink soft coral feeding on the plankton. Anemones cling to everything, even an old drain pipe. The lobsters reach epic proportions. And fish thrive like this camouflaged sea raven blending in with the bottom. A shrimp rests on a sponge. And a whelk, a kind of large snail, searches for a meal. Unfortunately, the whelk is about to become dinner for my favorite animal, the Atlantic wolffish. Wolffish might have big teeth, but these fish are no threat to people. They like to eat whelks and crabs. Wolffish often get together in pairs during the summer to lay their eggs. They hang out in the same den under a rock. After the female lays around 10,000 eggs, the male kicks her out and guards the eggs for several months until they hatch. Here you can see the egg mass behind the male way inside his den. Over the years, I've become friendly with a wolffish I call Gene. He can't resist a whelk or two when I bring them right to his front door. It took me a couple of years to get him comfortable enough with me to come all the way out of his den. Even then, he's pretty skittish. I've heard about Pacific wolffish that are bigger and friendlier, and I want to go meet them. So I'll have to travel from Maine all the way to British Columbia. My journey takes me from Eastport to Vancouver. 
Next, I have to drive out to Port Hardy where my dive boat awaits. Well, four hours to Port Hardy on the beautiful roads of Vancouver Island. In the drizzling rain, I board the Mamro, my dive boat for the week. Soon, under a clearing sky, we're underway. Captain Dan drives the boat past gorgeous forest wilderness on our way to Clam Cove, where we'll anchor the boat for a few days in search of Pacific wolf eels. Pacific wolf eel is the local name for this impressive fish, but it's not an eel at all. It's actually a fish, just like the Atlantic wolf fish, so it should be called a Pacific wolf fish. Whatever you want to call it, I'm going to find one. We depart aboard the skiff for our first dive. I start suiting up in anticipation. The water's 45 degrees, but my dry suit will keep me warm. And now I'm ready. Voila! Ready to dive in the cold Pacific Northwest. My cold water dive gear is bulky and cumbersome, but I'm used to it. Descending through the kelp, I find a world as rich in marine life as Eastport, driven by similar tidal action and nutrients. I swim over the edge of the wall to search for a Pacific wolf eel. There, sticking just its head out from its den, a fully grown male wolf eel stares at my camera. Nearby, a younger one with darker coloration, also curious what I'm up to, but not about to come out. Both have prominent teeth, just like the Atlantic wolffish, but they appear just as docile. Soon I turn back to observe the big male, and he starts coming right at me. He's coming out of his den. He's a lot longer than the Atlantic wolffish. I'm not sure what he's up to. He comes up to closely investigate my lens. Maybe he sees his reflection. He lets me hold him in my hand. They told me the Pacific ones were friendly, but this is incredible. I'm beginning to think maybe this fish has been fed quite a bit and he's looking for a handout, but I didn't bring him any food. He tries my arm to see how it tastes, but dry suits apparently aren't very good eating. Before long, he gets the idea that I haven't got anything to eat, so he goes over to see my dive buddy, Tim, who just happens to have brought a snack. Now, I would bet that there's no way a wolf eel would eat a sausage, but as it turns out, they love sausages. Who to thunk? After he gets his snack, the wolf eel heads back to his den, and then I can see why they call them wolf eels. This fish has a body six feet long, and it's more eel-like than fish-like. So why do we call the Atlantic ones fish and the Pacific ones eels? Good question, 
but they're both fish, and probably one of the most interesting fish to interact with in the entire world. No matter what you call them, they're cool. Meet Jonathan Bird. One of the world's top underwater nature cinematographers. Traveling the world on assignment for all the major networks, he is an Emmy Award winning authority on the underwater world. In freshwater or salt, reefs, wrecks, or caves, Jonathan documents the world beneath the waves. Welcome to the Blue World. I'm here in the jungles of the Yucatan, which is not the kind of place you'd normally expect to find an underwater kind of guy like me. But flowing beneath these forests are incredible underground rivers. And in places, holes in the forest floor like this one provide access to an amazing unseen world. The holes in the ground are called cenotes from a Mayan word meaning sacred well. But not all cenotes look like a hole in the ground. Some appear at first to be ponds. Yet they all share one common trait, their openings to underwater caves and caverns. Mexico's Riviera Maya in the Yucatan Peninsula is a vast rainforest filled with hundreds of cenotes. There are thousands of miles of underground rivers here. My adventure begins first thing in the morning at H2O Pro Diving in Tulum, where we load our gear into a van to begin the journey out into the middle of nowhere towards the cenote. My guide Marco Wagner is an experienced cave diving instructor who will keep me out of trouble with a safe introduction to the sport of cenote diving. So I can hardly wait to see this thing. Unless you're specially certified for cave diving, you should only dive with a local guide who knows the cenote well. Today we're diving a famous cenote called Calavera. Calavera means translated skull. And you see the big mouse and you see the small eyes. These are the small eyes where we see in the dive where the light beams are coming in and they look like disco lasers. Wow, this is really way out in the jungle. How do you think anybody found this place? I mean, they get explored by the owners of the land also itself. They discover the cenotes because they have huge pieces, huge chunks of land. And actually when they chop the trees down and they make trails, they found the cenote also from... Cenotes are here for, for the ancient Mayans also, which were like sacred wells for them. That's where the cenote is coming from, the word. It's coming from the Mayan word tonot, that means sacred well. So the Mayans, this was a really important source of water or? They also used the groundwater as well, but also for sacrificing for the gods, some cenotes were used. But there's still, there's still the groundwater also still comes from these underground rivers, what we have here in the peninsula. Wow, that's cool. It's deep too. So we're going to have to jump down. How far is that? That is about two, two meters, 50, three meters, more or less. Echo! Oh yeah, that's going to be fun. <laughs> now it's time to begin our dive. We grab our gear from the van and suit up near the road. Marco is wearing double tanks and all kinds of cool technical cave diving gear. Me? I'm just wearing my normal scuba gear and a few extra flashlights. in was plenty long and hot enough when I wasn't wearing my dive gear. That water is going to feel so good. Marco gives me some last words of advice before I take the plunge. I think I'm more worried about the 10-foot drop into the water than the dive itself. Cliff diving! Great. <laughs> the 
The water's extremely clear. I adjust my camera lights and follow Marco down below the earth. As we enter the cenote's cavern, I realize that I'm truly heading into another world. This is not my area of expertise. I follow Marco carefully and pay attention. We've brought some humongous lights to help illuminate the cavern for photography, and they really help show what it looks like. It's beautiful. The tunnels were formed by water rushing through and dissolving the soft limestone. But the intricate decorations hanging from the ceiling called stalactites can only form in a dry cave. Thousands of years ago, during the last ice age, the water levels were lower and these very caves were bone dry. That's when these impressive stalactites were formed. On a visit to a dry cave, I can observe the actual growth of stalactites. But it's pretty slow. It works like this. When it rains up in the rainforest, the water percolates through the limestone, and along the way it dissolves a little bit of the limestone. Then it drips from the roof of the cave, and over thousands of years, each drip leaves a little bit of limestone behind, forming an icicle-like structure called a stalactite. They get longer and longer and longer with time, but the water continues to drip, and eventually it hits the floor of the cave, forming a little bump, and that bump gets bigger and taller and taller, forming sort of like an upside-down icicle called a stalagmite. If you wait long enough, the two of them keep getting longer and longer until they connect into what is called a column. At the end of the Ice Age, the sea levels rose, and so too did the groundwater levels in the Yucatan. Soon, these huge subterranean caverns filled with water, leaving the stalactites frozen in time. In some places, the caverns have huge air pockets where the water doesn't go all the way to the top. Here, we can surface for a breath and take a look around. Some of the cenotes can even be explored by snorkelers. Good buoyancy control in the cavern is essential. The limestone formations are incredibly beautiful, yet fragile sculptures. The formations took thousands of years to form, but a single careless fin kick could destroy them in seconds. So we must kick gently and stay off the bottom. The floor of the cenote is covered in super fine silt. Swimming too close to the bottom would stir it up and reduce visibility to zero, which could be very dangerous. As I follow Marco deeper, the water starts to get weird and blurry looking. Many of these underground rivers make their way to the ocean. At some point along their journey, the water transitions from fresh to salt water. Salt water and fresh water have different densities. The interface between the two different densities can cause an optical condition called a halocline, where the water appears blurry. It's a weird, swirly, foggy haze. I follow Marco down below the halocline and into the salt water. I can taste the salt on my lips, and the temperature is about five degrees warmer. Soon we reach the Swiss cheese room. Down here, a chemical reaction with the salt water eats away some of the limestone, creating thousands of holes in the rock and the unique Swiss cheese appearance. It's a completely different kind of formation than I saw in the freshwater part of the cavern. As we swim into the far reaches of the cenote, we eventually reach a point where we can no longer see sunlight from the opening. 
This has now become true cave diving, a much more dangerous activity. Here we find a sign warning divers to stop and go no further. People have become lost and drowned in these vast labyrinths. This is as far as we go. Turning around, we head back out towards the entrance. Just before we reach the light of day, we find some Mayan pottery on the bottom, probably thrown into the cenote as an offering to the gods. The Mayans believed that the cenotes were pathways to the underworld. Offerings of gold, food, pottery, and even humans were made to the gods through the cenotes. With my scuba tank getting low, the time has come to leave the cenote, so I head back to the surface. In the shallow water just below the jungle, tiny fish come over to check me out. Some of them nibble on my hair and ears. They must be really hungry if they think I look like lunch. Wow, I can't believe all the cool things I saw in this cenote. Who would have thought that there's so much amazing stuff hiding under the floor of the forest? And even though I'm done with my diving for the day, I think it's time for one more dip. Woo! Most fish are completely harmless, but there are a few species of extremely venomous fish that can sting. In many cases, this venom is so powerful that it can actually kill humans. The most dangerous fish in the world live on Pacific coral reefs. Let's go take a look. Heading down, I begin my search for venomous fish. Most are well camouflaged and hard to find. With much assistance from an experienced dive master, I find a stonefish well hidden in the reef. It can change color to match its surroundings. Unless you know exactly where to look, you will never see a stonefish until it moves. Incidentally, touching a stonefish like this is dangerous. The reef has a few dangerous characters, and the stonefish is by far one of the most dangerous. The expertly camouflaged stonefish is the deadliest fish in the world. Its dorsal spines contain a highly toxic venom. Its body is shaped like a blob, and it hobbles more than swims. Sometimes stonefish bury themselves in the sand. They're ambush predators, holding perfectly still for hours, waiting for something bite-sized to swim by. The stonefish has a sting so powerful it can kill a grown man, and the pain is incredibly severe. The stonefish has a slightly less toxic relative called a scorpionfish. It can still sting humans, but it's rarely fatal. It's just really painful. A small group of damselfish are hovering near the reef. But nearby, watching and not moving a muscle, is a scorpionfish. His perfect camouflage is the result of skin that can change color to match the surroundings. The only thing that gives him away is the slight movement of his gills as he breathes. 
On top of his body, his dorsal fin contains the venomous spines, the armor to back up the camouflage. He's watching the damselfish who are blissfully unaware of his presence. Soon, a damselfish comes too close. Not far away, I find a lionfish hiding in the coral. If those needles all over the fish look sharp, I can assure you it's because they are. Not only that, each one is like an independent syringe ready to inject venom into any animal foolish enough to try to eat a lionfish. Almost nothing can prey on these fish once they're fully developed. During the day, they generally don't do much, but at night, things change. A small fish on the sand is blissfully unaware of the predator emerging from the darkness. Like its namesake, the lionfish pounces on prey and easily consumes its victim in a single gulp. Small fish don't stand a chance. Not far away from the reef, an area of rubble and sand provides a habitat for a well-camouflaged predator. The spiny devilfish is almost invisible if it doesn't move. But the hunting has not been so good here, so it's off to a better spot. The devilfish crawls along the bottom using modified pectoral fin spines as feet. The spiny devilfish sees a potential snack. Unfortunately, a line cheek wrasse saw it too. The devilfish is not pleased. Not far away, a scorpion fish is doing its best to look like a rock. A damselfish barely escapes, but not without injury. The scorpionfish goes hungry, but the spiny devilfish caught some luck. The injured damselfish has taken a turn for the worse. Although the stonefish, scorpionfish, and lionfish are the most venomous fish in the ocean, they actually account for very few injuries to people. The fact is that if you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone too. Many more divers are injured by sea urchins, jellyfish, and crown of thorns sea stars than by venomous fish, but that's a story for another day. Don't go away. Jonathan is going after one of the coolest sharks around, the Greenland shark. We often think of sharks as creatures of the tropics, living in clear, warm waters near coral reefs, or perhaps prowling the shallows near a beach. But sharks live all over the world, in all of the oceans, from the tropics to the Arctic, from the shallows to the deep sea. This is one such animal, the Greenland shark, named after the place where it was first seen. This massive carnivore lives in the coldest water on Earth, the icy depths of the Arctic Ocean. 
But you don't need to go all the way to the Arctic to see one of these sharks. In recent years, divers have been getting surprise visits by Greenland sharks right here in the St. Lawrence. In the remote Canadian town of Bay Camo in Quebec, Greenland sharks come into shallow water during the summer. They enter a narrow, deep bay where the surface is darkened by tannins from river runoff. The visibility is not very good. I'm going out to see if I can dive with one of these monster sharks in the St. Lawrence. My guide to diving with the Greenland sharks is Sylvain Surois, a local dive instructor and dive boat operator. He's been diving with the Greenland sharks for many years. So Sylvain, um, how do we get the sharks to come over to us underwater? Do we have some bait or some chum or something? We're not going to use some bait. Those sharks are curious. They are predators. They want to know what invade their territory. So they're going to come to see us. Wait a minute. You're telling me that they're just going to come over out of curiosity? Yes. We're strangers in their territory. So they're going to investigate us, turn around, and go back to their daily routine. Wow. Well... This I gotta see. Let's go diving. Let's go diving. Dry suits take diving to another level of complexity. We begin suiting up to dive in the chilly water of the St. Lawrence. I need a dry suit to stay warm because the water rarely goes above 40 degrees. That's cold. I jump into the water, grab my camera, and head towards the bottom. But something is wrong. The water's not cold. It's nearly 60 degrees. Sylvain starts banging a pair of rocks together. He believes this will attract the sharks because they're curious about the sound. I see a kind of fish called sand lance, but no sharks. So this time no luck, Jonathan? Nothing. We went down. We sat at about 65, 70 feet for an hour and we looked all directions into the darkness. And I do mean darkness. <laughs> and we saw nothing. I'm not one to give up easily, so we head out the next day to try again. Well, it's the second day of the trip so far. Four dives, zero sharks. Needless to say, shark diving is not always predictable. I enter the water again with my fingers crossed. We head to the bottom, engulfed in near darkness. The bottom's covered in beautiful anemones. And a crab scurries away from my lights. Sylvain does his best to attract the sharks, clicking his rocks together. But nothing shows up. The water's just too warm. I got it. Fifty-five degrees at the bottom. Fifty-five, yeah. Another dive with no sharks. Normally, I'd be thrilled with water that's 20 degrees too warm. I mean, who doesn't love warm water? But these are Arctic sharks. They like really cold water. So if I want to find any sharks, i got to find some cold water. And that probably means we're going to have to dive deep. The next day, we move the boat a little further from shore. Down on the bottom, it's so dark my camera can barely produce an image of Sylvain in the twilight at 110 feet. But good news, the water's cold at this depth. We only wait a few minutes and then, out of the darkness comes a big shape. It's a Greenland shark! I can't believe it! Just like Sylvain said, it's coming over to give me a look. No chum, no bait, just pure curiosity. 
What an odd looking shark with a big round body and a small mouth filled with rows of tiny razor sharp teeth. Most of my encounters with sharks are in warm, clear water. It's so weird to be swimming with a huge shark like this in cold, murky water. This shark is more than 10 feet long, but it's only a small one. Greenland sharks reach a massive 21 feet, making them among the largest carnivorous sharks in the world. Yet studies suggest they grow extremely slowly, less than an inch a year. So this 10-footer may be 100 years old. And that's nothing. Researchers think the Greenland shark may live to be 200 years old. Even though it's said that these sharks don't see well, this one appears to be watching me, his eye following my every move. The shark stays with me for 15 minutes, swimming slowly and not presenting any threat to me at all. He just seems curious. But soon he picks up the pace and I can no longer keep up. He swims into the gloom and my dive is over because I'm low on air. Sylvain and I head back to the surface. Woo! I've finally seen a Greenland shark! We decided to go a little deeper, 110 feet, just so we could get into that colder water. And when we got down there, it was freezing cold, and then out of the darkness came the big, huge Greenland shark. It was incredible! On the way back to the dock, I still can't believe what an amazing encounter I just had. Sometimes all the effort is worth it in the end.